So I've been doing this show for seven years now as of next month, and I've never really broken from the video essay format. It's starting to feel like every month I release a video that boils down to, hey, this game you don't know about is probably better or more important than you think. Or, hey, this game you already know about is probably worse or less important than you think. And while I love doing me some video essays, I can't help but feel a little constrained by the format. So I thought I'd shake things up a bit and try a new show. Don't worry, the old show's not going anywhere. I just wanted to see if I could do something else on occasion. Will it work? I don't know, let's find out. First, though, since this is the first one, I suppose I should introduce what I'm trying to get this thing to be, but I also want to get to the meat of the new stuff ASAP, so let's do this in as quick a fashion as I know how. A rapid-fire Q&A where I answer my own questions. What is this thing? The elevator pitch is that I want to combine birth movie deaths say something nice feature with Red Letter Media's best of the worst and a sprinkling of Alison Pregler's movie nights with maybe a little bit of Dan Olson's streaming bad video games by diving into randomly selected games from Steam and likely in the future itch.io to see what's out there in the great unknown piles of games accumulating on digital store shelves and try to say something positive but honest. That is, I'm not hunting for the next bad rats to take a dump on, and the goal isn't to find the most crass acid flips and swear angrily at them. In a way, the show is continuing my argument against curation by looking at what's out there, good and bad, with an eye towards celebrating glitchy B-games that try something new, outsider art that you'd never see hit the mainstream games industry, and just plain weird stuff. All of which I think is cool. Why random games? Well, for the same reason that Best of the Worst does it. I don't want to be seen as curating these things myself, because that kind of defeats the point. As soon as I'm picking games, then I'm choosing what to highlight, either to celebrate or to mock, and if I'm going to go through the effort of doing that, I might as well just start a review show that highlights the best underplayed titles, and frankly there's already a website that tries to crowdsource that. Besides, I really want to see what's out there. I want to genuinely look at random games, or as close to random as I can get, so that we can look at what's in that pile. There's a mountain of games being released these days, and I don't know if we have a clear picture of what that content really looks like, and I'd like to probe that a bit with randomly selected games. I do the selection by using CM Anderson's Steam API to pick six games to feature on the show, but then I use a tool I built myself in Unity to pick three to actually look at. I do filter out some stuff in the first step, namely any big name titles or known properties. There's no reason to look at Braid or Fallout 3 or whatever, everyone knows those games. And I also try to limit my selections to things that are more than a year old. I know we're trying to stay positive on this show, but I still feel like being chosen to be lovingly riffed on or looked at before you've really had a chance to find your own footing is a little mean-spirited. So basically the criteria are unknown things, at least to me, over a year old. Anything else? Yeah, the show format here is really not set in stone. I'm going to try to find this thing in the edit, but it might take a few episodes of messing with doing it with other people, or maybe putting my face on camera, or something I haven't even thought of yet to really make it pop. So give this pilot a little breathing room and let me know what is and isn't working, and maybe we'll see if we can get this off the ground. Okay? Okay. Let's get started. Okay, so let's look at the batch of games this episode has either been cursed or blessed with, depending on your perspective. Up first... Apocalypse Party's Over. Hit enemies in the face with your own Johnson and make the apocalypse happen. Johnson is in all caps. Play with your friend and help Jesus... Jesus? I'm assuming it's Jesus? Oh no, they mean Jesus. Okay. Play with your friend and help Jesus to achieve his goal, the end of the world. Choose three different characters with their peculiar skills and bizarre powers and save the world from itself. So in this, the inaugural episode of the show, on our first game we look at, we're already mocking religion and talking about genitals. Oh boy. Well, that's option number one. Congo. Kahango? Kahango? It's, it's, it's Congo. Unfortunately, not related to the, um, to the film from the, the 90s. Um, the, the, the best movie ever made of Michael Crichton's work. Um, but this, this game, its description is, quote, Grab some friends and dive into the jungles of Congo, a co-op horror action game set in the dark and haunting jungle. Light-fearing demons attack from the shadows. Work together as a team to find rescue from wave after wave of intense attack by scavenging an array of weapons and items. Um, it... It, it looks like a multiplayer top-down top down shooter is, is really what it is. I, I don't get the horror element. I don't know why you said it in Congo if it's going to be with demons. I, I figured it would lean more into the, like, you know, like the movie Congo, where you, you have mystical mountain gorillas, gray apes, and scary, like, demons. I, I don't know why there are demons in the Congo, but I guess, I guess we might find out. Um, also available is... 
Dahan Monsters Challenge Circus. This one is rated at mostly negative, and the description on Steam is one sentence. Slay the evil that has decimated your universe. That's it. Full stop. Just just slay the evil that has decimated your universe. Um, also not optimistic looking is the fact that the, um, the, the, the game came out in 2014, so the trailer is in 4.3, which is not a great look these days. Um, it, it looks also like a top-down action game, much like Congo, but more single-player focused. Um, and a little bit, I, I don't know, we'll, we'll, we'll see what this is. Dahan, Dihan? I'm, I'm not sure how to pronounce it, frankly, but it's, it's, we'll see what it is. Following that, there is... Box Out. Box Out's description on Steam, help Boxy escape its factory and survive the outside world by mastering its six transformations. Rocket, steel, bubble, spikes, vapor, and fire. More than a hundred levels of increasing difficulty will put your skills, reflexes, and cunning to the test. Die, retry, perfect your run, and dominate the competitive. That's it. It just ends with dominate the competitive. Um... Okay, yeah, if you go to the About This Game section, it, it, it has that same uh, little blurb, but completes with Die, Retry, Protect Your Run, and Dominate the Competitive Leaderboards, which, okay, okay, that makes more sense. And it looks like a sort of 2D puzzly, 2, 2D puzzle platformer, 2D action puzzle platformer is really where you're going with sort of a, a real simple pixely aesthetic. Cute, but we'll, we'll, we'll see where it goes. I, I do hope to dominate the competitive. After that, we have Bumper. Bumper is a casual game made on the Blender game engine where the player must to destroy the vehicles as much as possible, trying not to get caught by the police, reach the checkpoints to get time, and improve your weapons. And it is an isometric-ish looking 3D top-down racing game. A lot of top-down stuff in this random mix. Um... You are, your goal, as stated, is to destroy the vehicle as much as possible while trying not to get caught by the police reach checkpoints to get time. I, it, You can tell that from the screenshots. So, you know. And finally, we have... Blowy Fish. Blow, not Blowy Fish? Blowy Fish. Blowy Fish is an animated 2D physics platformer with slingshot controls. Pull a grumpy blowfish by its tail to make it jump forward through increasingly difficult levels or compete for high scores in classic endless mode. Um, and much like Boxy, box, box, the box one, it, it looks it looks like sort of a puzzly 2D platformer um, with movement mechanics based on stretching its tail and, and launching yourself forward um, with a lot of, I guess, clothing customization for a blowfish? Because they really wanted you to put your personal spin on your, your Blowfish character. Um, well, we'll see. We'll see what this is about. Anyways, that's our roster of games for this episode. So let's see what one I'm going to spend my first couple hours playing. Um, I, I can't commit to how many hours I'm going to be playing this game, but I am curious to see how much I end up playing whatever one we land on. So this is completely random. I have no control over this. I'm hitting the button now. Congo. We landed on Congo. Uh, let's, let's play Congo. So, it turns out this absolutely is a knockoff of Michael Crichton's Congo. You play as a character stranded in the dense Congolese jungle and evil monkeys are after you. While you try to call for help or refuel a jeep or just get the lights on, ever more evil monkeys storm in around you to seal your fate. It's... it's Congo. They're not albino gorillas, there's no Amy, and no one is selling Pepsi, but it's Congo. The film Congo. Now up front, I can't really be fair to this game because by the nature of this show, I played it alone and it's really designed to be played with some friends. It's basically not quite top-down, not quite over-the-shoulder Left for Dead made on the cheap and featuring monkeys. 
And that could have easily been a generic arcadey action shooter, but Congo decided to emphasize the horror elements of its general concept. This game is mostly clawing your way through the jungle at night. Not all of the levels are dark, but most are. And when they go dark, they go oppressively dark. But it kind of works for the jump scares they're going for. I wouldn't say the game is scary, per se, but it does have a certain tension it tries to keep by hiding the apes from you. There's something about taking a few steps and then just scanning the horizon with your pistol, hoping to see the ginormous auto-targeting reticule highlight something that is genuinely a little nerve-wracking. Hearing a monkey grunt off in the distance and doing a quick 360 to look for targets but seeing none highlighted is definitely disquieting. It's a level of atmospheric tension you don't see in lower budget games that often. There was a moment there where I was able to get my bearings and kind of know what to do but before the monotony of dying over and over again had set in, where the game actually clicked. I was cautiously making progress and managed to take down a few of the aggressive with my machete before they pounce me. Once you realize it's basically slender and the game is trying to spawn monsters in near you in the dark, you can start sensing its rhythms a bit. And there's a nice forgiveness mechanic where if you fire just as they leap out of the shadows at you, you aren't pounced but the monkey is killed and you drop your gun. Which is also bad because the gun is off in your flashlight. This makes for an awesome scramble to pick up your dropped weapon, which I think would have been even more engaging if I had been playing with a partner who may have been able to pick it up and help assist me. <laughs> Also helping the survival horror thing is that ammo is relatively scarce, certainly more so than any Left 4 Dead game I've ever played. It does make attempts to play the game from a single player perspective almost impossible, but it also does keep the tension up. Flashlights, flares, and generators all turn light into a resource, and it's cool to see the game lean a bit into that. Darkness is where the monsters have the advantage and where they spawn, and you want to downplay that wherever possible. The problem with all of that, unfortunately, is in the design of the levels. Left 4 Dead levels are mostly linear, even the randomized bits are only random between three or four spots to prevent min-maxing and finding easy solutions through levels. That linearity made it easy to know where to go next, you mostly just were following a lighted path. Congo doesn't do this, and instead just gives you a locale indicator that floats on the edges of your screen and provides no distance indication. It also provides no instructions on how to get to the objective, so you're not entirely sure if, when you reach the end of the path and have to turn away from the objective, whether you're going to a dead end or you're going around a thing to get to your target. Left 4 Dead levels also used light to emphasize where you needed to go next, but because Congo wants you to use light as a weapon and march through the dark jungle to be vulnerable, it also doesn't do that. Congo's levels are sprawling labyrinths of pitch black that you navigate with a compass, but no map. This makes achieving your objectives difficult. Also, not helping things is the camera, especially when things exist between you and your avatar, and doubly so if you're trying to aim at the time. It's not top-down, and it's not over the shoulder, it's this weird in-between that lets all sorts of geometry get in the way and makes aiming feel really wonky. Like, I feel aiming and navigation would be easier from top-down, and I feel like an over-the-shoulder view would make the horror elements work better, but it sits uncomfortably in between them. But the UI is maybe the worst part of this game. The animations are all way understated for what is a game you view from a pretty far distance away, so it's kind of hard to get a beat on what's happening at a glance. Then other UI elements like lockpicking are summoned like 10 feet in the air, which is a problem in a game where you can't look up. Then there's defense mode, which operates kind of like the generator levels from Left 4 Dead, where your goal is to defend a particular object from attack from evil monkeys. But instead of putting that object's health in your UI, or notifying you when it's under attack through some sort of audio cue so you can get back and defend it, or anything of that sort, it just has a small circle of health you can see when you're standing next to it. So especially in the single player games, it's easy to go out scavenging for weapons and stuff, and then get a sudden game over screen for seemingly no reason. <laughs> All that said, this is kind of the ideal game I'm going for on this show. Congo isn't terrible. There is merit in its multiplayer monkey horror based adventures loosely inspired by, but legally distinct from, a 1990s Jurassic Park cash in. It's a weird premise and I kind of love it for that. I'm sure there are a group of three or four friends out there for whom Congo is their favorite film and this would be an absolute blast for them to play over a weekend. 
but it's also a game that is so janky that it fell through the cracks, a game with enough problems in its execution that it could be instructive in how not to build a UI, and a game that took the time to build in some sort of progression system, but not navigable levels. And yeah, the fact that it was a Left 4 Dead clone that I was playing entirely by myself probably didn't help here. All right, that was Congo. That sure was a thing. Um, let's uh, let's see what's next. <laughs> Blowy fish! Yay! It, it, my my reaction is about the same as Blowy Fish is there, so we'll we'll see what this is about. Blowy Fish. Blowy Fish is about a puffer fish that is catatonic, dead. It can't swim. It sinks like a stone. Blowy Fish is also a really good example of what happens when you try to cash in on game trends without really understanding how they work or what made them popular. It's a port of an Android game, and that is readily apparent from the way the game plays, but it's also this really weird cargo cult take on popular phone game mechanics. Like, Blowy Fish is clearly a game trying to ape Angry Birds. You pull back to launch your fish forward down the tubes, where he travels in an arc-like trajectory because, again, this fish don't swim. And as far as touchscreen mechanics go, the Angry Birds one is a pretty good one. It's expressive and gives players a lot of control, but there's no time pressure and you can do it with a single gesture. It's great for playing games with your thumb on a phone while waiting in line at the DMV. But Blowy Fish's implementation of this has... problems. Like, Angry Birds is arguably influenced by something like Peggle, or at the very least follows the same design methodology. You ask players to angle a thing, then watch the wacky, pleasing chaos that ensues. <laughs> In Peggle, it's lighting things up and hearing the tinks increasing in pitch as you rack up points, culminating in a rainbow explosion of celebration. And in Angry Birds, it's letting your bird monster thing fly free and smash into towers, knocking down blocks and damaging glass and taking out piggies. A good shot in either of those games can feel really good to pull off. The dopamine release of seeing the results of your single flick are what made the games so engaging. You chase that dragon. Blowy Fish has two problems in this regard. One, it's a game of obstacle avoidance. The absolute best thing that can happen when you flick Blowy Fish forward is that he flops down somewhere safe. So that dopamine release of causing chaos and gaining points and reveling in bedlam is gone, and replaced by the terror of just watching your avatar careen towards obstacles you didn't see coming. <laughs> Which is the other problem. This game lets you travel four or five screens per launch, but there's no way to see four or five pages over. You can only see what's right in front of you. Consequently, trying to play this game by making angled jumps that go the furthest distance possible is not advisable because you're almost certain to hit an urchin. <laughs> Instead, the game becomes launching Blowy Fish exactly one screen forward into the ceiling or floor in order to safely stop and then start again. There's no time mechanic, so there's no incentive not to take it slow and easy. So yeah, this becomes effectively a game of throwing a fish into the ceiling or floor at three feet an hour. Yay. However, it's not all bad. The game has, of all things, a dress-up system with unlocks, and somehow it's never failed to get a smile out of me. And it's not because it's the most expressive or interesting dress-up system that would let me make this fish my own. No, the design of this comedic system worked precisely because I couldn't see the outcome. So you can trigger bonus rounds at any time once you've collected 100 stars, and when you do, you're basically put into a Plinko game with three rewards at the bottom. But inside of the bonus area, you are regular old blowy fish. You can't see what items you had equipped previously, and you can't see what items you win each round. But they are automatically equipped as soon as you start the normal game up again. 
This means that each time you exit the bonus round, you see a newly dressed up blowy fish for the first time, and because all of the items are a hodgepodge of nonsensical clothing options applied to an animated blowfish that doesn't look like he wants to be there any more than you do, for some reason it's funny to me every time. And for reasons I have yet to divine, the unlock system is tied to an energy timer. So when you first open the game, in the first few minutes you get a big prize worth a bunch of stars to begin your fish clothing collection, and then 10 minutes later you get the next prize that's a bit smaller, and then 30 minutes after that you start getting more random and erratic prizes. It's basically the same system free-to-play games use to limit content and push you towards some sort of monetization mechanic, but no monetization mechanic exists here. Much like the core flicking mechanic, it feels like a mechanic that's included because other people do it, but it doesn't seem to understand why you do these mechanics or what makes them enjoyable. They're there because other people put them in their games, and those games seem to sell. Finally, I feel I have to comment on the music. It's all Creative Commons attribution license stuff, your Kevin McLeods and whatnot, and that's fine. Both this show and Spoiler Warning have used Creative Commons music in the past, and it's a great way for low-budget productions to include some audio. But I feel like more attention could have been paid to the selection of tracks, let's say. It's got banjos, and it's got rock, and it's got polka. It's all over the place, especially for a nautical-themed fish game. It's just really eclectic, and it further cements this game as one that has no idea what it's doing or what it's even going for. Blowy Fish is a... weird game. A PC port of an Android tablet game that doesn't understand how mobile games work to begin with, but it's one of those games where I kind of wish I knew the intent of the developer. Like, if this is a programmer's first title and they just wanted to prove that they could make a game like anyone else, then I'd say it's functional and polished and they just need to work with a proper game designer. Dear lord, do they need to work with a proper game designer. But it robs so nakedly from other sources and offers so few ideas of its own that it also kind of comes off as a cynical shovelware app. And honestly, without that context, I could go either way on this game. I kind of hate playing it because it's so tone-deaf mechanically, but then polka music comes on while I'm aiming my bomb-wielding Lederhosen Sam Fisher blowfish, and I kind of can't help but laugh. Yeah. Alright, that certainly was a blowy fish. Um, let, let's take a look at the last game. I'm, I'm sort of dreading whatever number is going to come out of here. Bumper! Bumper, okay. Alright, Bumper, the Blender game. This is admittedly not the not the one I was hoping for, but we'll uh It's got a car with a flamethrower, that's cool, right? Let's 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 run with Bumper. Let's do it. I went into Bumper with, let's say, low expectations. It's a $1 game that was on sale for 50 cents, and then I discovered that it runs on the Blender game engine, and look, I don't like bad-mouthing game engines. You can make something cool out of just about anything, but Blender is not really a commercially viable game engine as much as it is a really great, amazing 3D modeling tool. And then I saw the game was 350 megs, and a game that looks like this probably shouldn't be demanding almost a gigabyte of hard drive space. And then when the game launched, it launched in a window, and every time I clicked, it played an explosion sound. So I was sort of setting my sights really low when I finally sat down and played it. And you know what? I actually really enjoyed it. 
So at first the gameplay loop looks insultingly simple. You need to drive from checkpoint to checkpoint to keep your time up. If you run out of time, you lose. And while you're driving from checkpoint to checkpoint, you want to blow up cars, because that's how you get points. But as you blow up cars, you attract the attention of the police who will try to stop you. So it's basically a GTA Rampage high score game with a tank. And the controls are pretty nice. The car feels responsive, but the front wheel drive gives it just enough of a weird turning radius that there's some challenge to getting around. And the shooting feels snappy with a satisfying boom and camera jiggle as cars explode. So the game feel was really on point here. And my first time through, I blew up a bunch of cars and then died when the police ran into me. And I was like, okay, this is cute. It's simple and aimless, but it feels good in your hands. Whatever. But I kept playing because it was fun. And it turns out there are a few other hidden mechanics. Like at first glance, the cops can't be destroyed. They just get disabled before following you again, which led to my defeat a few times. <laughs> then I noticed that they can be defeated. You just need to disable a given police car a certain number of times. This meant that there was actually a bit of a hidden strategy I didn't realize. You need to not just run from the police, but keep their population in check in order to avoid death. And hey, each time they die, they drop the game's namesake, a bumper that makes you immune to collision damage for a bit. So I keep playing with these new strategies, and I up my high score a few times, and at some point start breaking through some high score thresholds and get additional permanent unlocks. And then I realize, this game is kind of a roguelite? As I play, I get high scores, and I unlock new tech that makes it easier to play and get even higher scores. It kind of ruins the game from a high score challenge perspective, but unlocking 30 second checkpoints lets me focus more on blowing up cars, or razor tires that let me blow up cars by running over them means that I don't have to necessarily shoot every car I see, or even just the gimmick of nighttime mode were all cool things I didn't expect to be able to see or do, and I kept playing to get a higher score than last time just to see what new thing would be unlocked next. When I first opened the game, I was expecting a crass, low effort cash grab with Microsoft Paint art that probably would wouldn't even run without crashing. Instead, it's kind of exactly the sort of game you would expect for a dollar, in the best way possible. There's not a ton of content here, it's only the one tiny city and you can unlock pretty much everything in 20 to 45 minutes depending on how good you are at driving and blowing up cars, and the camera position did start to frustrate me after a while. I get a lot of my points by just shooting off screen and blowing up cars randomly driving by, but for a game that I bought for 50 cents? It genuinely surprised me through the introduction of new mechanics. It felt good in my hands, and it kept me playing for over a half an hour. There are literally games I have spent two orders of magnitude more money on that I have gotten far less enjoyment out of. I don't know if I'd recommend everyone rush out and buy the thing, but it's exactly the kind of gem I never would have in a million years played without this show, and I hope we can find more stuff like this if we make more episodes. 